grateful and thankful to God for you all. Good morning, my brothers and sisters around the world. We thank God for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. I know sometimes it's hard to get out on from under the covers, but because we want to praise God, we do it anyways. So I praise God that he brought you to this virtual space to praise his name. And once again, thank you to Elder Mo uh, Easy and Brother Moses and the team. Thank you for the beautiful music. I heard the hymns of my childhood, which soothes my soul. So let's praise God for who he is. And shall we pray? Father God, in the name of Jesus. Ha. Lord, I'm so grateful and thankful for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for waking us up in our right minds that we know their God, that we know which toothbrush to hold. We know that it's water. Our minds are connected to you. Our spirit is connected to you. So God, we thank you. Father God, I ask that your word come alive in our hearts today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, yesterday we ended with Jonah. Today we're starting with Jeremiah. This morning, our scripture is taken from Jeremiah chapter four. Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter one, verse four through 10. Jeremiah chapter one, verses four through 10. 10, and I am reading from the NIV version. And it says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am too young. Of course, the Lord is saying that. That's who he is. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Verse 9, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Here ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. We know that we've been going over our theme for the week. Let's be about our father's business. And today, our sub topic is called for such a time as this. This morning, we will explore the profound calling that God has for each one of us, as illustrated in Jeremiah chapter one. For those who are tuning in for the first time this week, our theme for this week is let's be about our father's business. And the subtopic again, it's a it's called for such a time as this. This call that I'm talking about is a call for us to embrace our divine mission with the same zeal as Jeremiah and fulfill the great commission given to us by Jesus in Matthew 28. As we explore this portion of Jeremiah, it's really for us to understand the context first and identify the distractions that can hinder our mission, even when we are called for such a time as this. 
So let's put some context into this so you understand what was going on at the time when God called Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called by God during a tumultuous period in Israel's history, marked by political instability and spiritual decline. In many of our countries, we are seeing political uprisings, societal breakdowns, spiritual decline, especially since the pandemic. Many of our churches are half filled with members each week. False doctrines and false teachers are taking over the internet and television screens. Similar to what was happening during Jeremiah's time. The opening verses of Jeremiah 1, verses 1, 2, and 3 provide the historical backdrop, in, backdrop indicating that Jeremiah's ministry began in the 13th year of Josiah's reign and extended throughout the reigns of several kings of Judah. This was a time when the nation faced imminent judgment from God due to its persistent idolatry and unfaithfulness to God. This world that we live in is facing judgment because like the nations of Jeremiah's time, people are using witchcraft and crystals and sage bush to ward off evil, not realizing that by participating in such things, they are inviting demonic spirits into their lives. There's a separation between God's work and the work of the enemy. Let's focus and be about our father's business. God wanted a person who was willing and who had a relationship with him to tell the people and the leaders what was going to happen through God's judgment. Jeremiah had a divine calling. In Jeremiah chapter one, verses four and five, it says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This profound declaration reveals that God has a purpose for each one of us established even before our birth. It emphasizes God's sovereign plan and intimate knowledge of our lives. He knitted us together in our mother's room, and he knows he has plans for us. He has plans that we will accomplish for his glory. It's all about the glory of the Lord. To build his kingdom. Many of us are not aware of the calling on our lives. And so some of us wander around 20, 30, 40 years, and then we get to our older ages and, and we may realize the number of times we, we missed the opportunities to bring someone to the Lord because we were so busy, caught up in other things. We didn't understand the calling on our lives. Jeremiah's initial response was hesitation and self-doubt. And he said, alas, sovereign Lord, in verse six, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. It was if uh, he was saying, how I wish I could really help you out, Lord, but uh, I'm just a young man. But God reassured him. The Lord said to him, don't say that. Don't say you're too young. What I want you to do, I want you to go to everybody I sent you to and do whatever and say whatever I command you. I'm going to be with you. Don't be afraid. I'll be there. That's in Jeremiah 7, 1, 7, and 8. God is also reassuring us 
Jesus reminded us in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you until the end of the world. What has God called you to do? We also have a divine appointment. All of us have an appointment. So we have divine appointments to carry out our father's business because we are called for such a time as this. The pandemic happened and we wondered about what's going to happen, but God rose up people to just fill the space, the virtual space with his word. And so even some people may not be coming to a building for service, they are finding service online. They are coming to the Lord. They're giving their hearts to Jesus. So they are divine appointments so that we can carry out our father's business. Like Jeremiah, we are called to a divine purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says to us, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. My God, your God, our heavenly father, he knows the future. So he takes care of everything. If we but trust him and rely on him. Each of us has been uniquely crafted by God to fulfill his mission on earth. The great commission of Matthew 28 is the essence of being about the father's business. It is a call to action that extends to all believers, urging us to spread the gospel and make disciples. Despite our divine calling, there are various distractions that can lead us astray from fulfilling the Great Commission. One of those distractions is materialism, the pursuit of wealth and possessions, which can overshadow our spiritual responsibilities. Jesus cautioned in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, don't get it twisted. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to get an education. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to put that education to use to provide for your family, but he is also calling you to put him first in your everyday life. Let others know who provided the money for that education. Let others know that when you pray, God answers in his own way because you're trusting him and relying on him that God does what is best for his children. God does not always say yes. Sometimes he says no, or sometimes he says wait. All because he has our eternal life in mind. He will do whatever is necessary to save us for his kingdom. Another distraction is busyness. Our daily schedules can become so packed that we neglect our spiritual duties. Whether you're an elder, a deacon, a deaconess, a usher, a greeter, a teacher, a doctor, a cashier, a lawyer, we can still get too busy for God. Have mercy on us. Psalms 46, 10 reminds us, be still and know that I am God. We must prioritize time with God to stay focused on his mission because we are called for such a time as this. 
and uncomfortable distraction of life is fear and doubt. Like Jeremiah, we might feel inadequate or fearful. However, God reassures us in Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You may say, Pastor, there's no other distraction now. You've already told us all these things that keep us from our calling. You told us about materialism, the busyness, the fear and the doubt. So what else can there be to make us distracted from doing the work of the Lord? I'm glad you asked. How about worldly pleasures? The temptations of worldly pleasures can distract us from our eternal purpose. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 warns us, do not love the world or anything in the world. If, anything, if, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. In order to embrace our calling, to tell others about the gospel and to be effective, we must remain connected to God. One of the first things we would do is prayer. Saints of God, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing our young people are dying from guns and knives and diseases. Jeremiah was a young man when God called him. And he could not have responded to God if he did not know what God's voice sounded like. We must have a personal and consistent devotional life. How often do any of you or attend prayer meetings and after you leave the prayer meeting, you never talk about God to anyone. You don't talk about what you hear. You don't share testimonies of how God is healed or how God has helped you. We don't share anything. We give an hour and we think, well, oh, that was enough for the day. Have mercy on us. What if God, what if God was not compassionate and he said, okay, I woke you up this morning. I'm going to let you have an hour of the time today and then that's it. I'm, I'm withdrawing myself from you. But because he's long suffering and because he's loving and because he is caring, even when we neglect to talk about him, even when we neglect to share his love, he still gives us more opportunities. When we pray, we must pray sincerely, confessing our sins to God, praising God for who he is, trusting in his will for our lives, and then we should sit still and listen for the Holy Spirit to give us our instructions. In societies around the world, sometimes our young people reject God. And sometimes it's because of how the older people present Jesus. Sometimes we present to our young people, we present the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as if they were waiting with a big stick to hit us over the head if we sin. But we neglect to tell our young people that Jesus loves them. We neglect to tell our young people he cares. We neglect to tell our young people he died for them. We neglect to tell our young people that he longs to embrace them. We neglect to tell our young people that he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother or sister. So we pray. Number two, how we stay connected to God to be about his business is, is studying the word. Yes, 
Sometimes we feel that if we read the Bible, that's studying the word. But no, that is reading the Bible, which is absolutely good for us. But we must study. You can start out by reading a chapter. Then go back to the beginning of the chapter and take one verse at a time. Second Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God, not unto man. It's not something to boast about. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Studying can help people learn more about, about God. It can help us learn how to serve God and others and how to distinguish truth from error. As you study the word of God, go back to praying and asking God for discernment. Studying the Bible can also help people overcome challenges, strengthen their relationship with God and become better witnesses for Christ. Read consistently. Praying so that you can understand the context. Use reliable resources. You don't have to have these big heavy books that I grew up with in the house to find some commentary. It's online now. And then apply what you have learned through prayer and studying. The third way to stay connected to God and be about his business of spreading the gospel is stepping out in faith. In verses 9 and 10 of Jeremiah 1, God did something profound. The Bible says, then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth and said to him, I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down. You cannot have the power of God in your life and the power to do his work if God does not put his blessing and his words in your mouth. And that means you have communion with him. Devotional life is important. The only way we can understand that we are called for such a time as this is when we exhibit faith in God. It may look like things are not going well, but if it is of God, hold on. And like Jeremiah, God will put his words in your mouth. He will open doors and windows and he will close those doors and windows that will lead you astray. Even though you might think the situation is perfect, but God sees the future. So he will open doors and windows to lead you to do the work for him. But the minute you start taking credit for it, he will close those doors and windows. Give God the glory. Jeremiah had an ear for the Lord because he was constantly praying. There's a song that says, faith in God can move a mighty mountain. Faith in God can calm the seas. Faith in God can move a desert to a fountain. Faith can win the victory. Have faith in God. Matthew 5, 16 says in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. To have faith is not just to believe in God, but to act on that belief by doing good and serving others. Amen. However, Matthew includes a pointed remind reminder here that the purpose of good works is not to elevate ourselves, but to glorify God. There are two potential action items here depending on where you are in your spiritual journey. First, if you are not already in the habit of making service a regular part of your routine, consider finding a way to do it. That means volunteering your time, donating money to a worthy cause, or looking for small ways that you can serve others in your day-to-day -day life. And secondly, ask yourself how you can bring glory to the name of the Lord. Hebrews 10 24 and 25 said, and let us consider how we may spur on one another toward love and good deeds, 
deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As I conclude, I've asked this question this week already, but I will ask it again because someone may not have been here this week. Will you accept the call to be about your father's business? Will you refrain from the excuses? I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too busy. I'm a widow. I'm a widower. It's time to roll up your sleeves and answer the call. But you must be listening so that you can hear the call that God has put on your life for such a time as this. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. He's your savior. He's your redeemer. He's your friend. He's your strong tower. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the rose of Sharon. But Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Beloved of the Lord, I encourage you to answer the call for such a time as this. Shall we pray? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for revealing your word. May it find a lodging place in our hearts so that we remember as we go down from this place today for you to remind us that there's a call in our lives for such a time as this, so that we can be about your business. We thank you and we give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.